All right, we're back. We're going to do Luke 17 now, and then Luke chapter 21 after this. And I'm uh, going to go verse by verse. And I want to show you that these events in Luke 17 and Luke 21 line up with Mark 13 and Matthew chapter 24. All right. Uh, if you wanted a gospel account of the rapture, something pointed doctrinally at Christians, you can go to John, the book of John, uh, chapter 10 in particular. Um, and again, I've talked about that in other studies. So we're not going to get into all that. But uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, Ephesians chapter 1, a lot of those passages, there's a lot of them in the Pauline epistles, talk about the rapture. The church, body of Christ being taken out before the time of Jacob's trouble. And you compare it with Revelation chapter 4, John goes up, he sees 24 elders that are crowned, been through the judgment seat of Christ, and a great multitude of angels in the resurrection. They neither marry nor are married. Or, get, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay? So you have the 24 elders, you have Christians there, this uh, great number of, of uh, angels there in Revelation chapter 5, redeemed to God by the blood of the Lamb out, out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation. So it's not talking about Old Testament Jews. It's talking about New Testament Christians. And they're there before the first seal is opened in Revelation chapter 6. So there are Christians in heaven blood-redeemed Christians in heaven before the first seal is opened, before the Antichrist is unleashed. Now, that's just a basic truth. And I hear people saying, yes, but um, could we possibly be here to see the Antichrist? And could we possibly... If you believe the just simple English of the King James Bible, there are Christians in heaven, blood-redeemed Christians in heaven, before the first seal is opened. That ends the argument. Okay? I don't care what your opinions are. I don't care what your feelings are. What some preacher has told you, there are Christians in heaven before the first seal is opened, before the Antichrist is unleashed. The Antichrist needs to be unleashed to confirm the covenant to begin the time of Jacob's trouble. People just, just have to mess with the scriptures and mess with it and mess with it and mess with it. It's just disgusting to me. But let's go through Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Isn't it interesting that most of the deception, most of the evil stuff out there in the world right now is affecting little children more than adults? Isn't that disgusting? The offenses of Hollywood with the wicked, vile, filthy movies. The offenses of the rock and roll industry and the, and the rap music and the, the fluoridated water and the, the toxicity in the food and the geoengineering spraying chemicals and things up there and, and all the different stuff. And who does it affect the most? It affects children, little children. It's disgusting. But you see, uh, the offenses will come. It's prophesied. Jesus said it's going to happen. Prophecy is pre-recorded history. Always remember that. It will come to pass. But, woe unto him through whom they come. Don't be part of helping the New World Order system come in. Fight it. You say, well, we can't stop it. I am aware of that. But you can fight it. Don't go to a self-checkout line. Okay? And there's a whole lot of other things I could say that you should not be doing as a Christian. You know, don't help this whole cashless system come in. But uh, that's another study. Verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. <laughs> when the Lord gives you a command like that, you know, to keep forgiving people, you know, and stuff, and, and you know, well... I need a little bit of an increase in our faith here, Lord. <laughs> you know, Not easy to do. Verse 6, And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it, shall, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, Go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. 
So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. Some good instruction in righteousness there, some correction, some reproof for you as a Christian. You know, there's a lot of things and you go, well, I, you know, Lord, ought to, you ought to answer my prayer because I, I, after all, I read my Bible and I pray and I, and I do this and I do that. Well, that's stuff you're commanded to do, brethren. And Lord, I'm not saying he won't reward you, but I'm just saying, you know, we can, we can get kind of a little bit uh, sissy sometimes, you know. Oh, well, Lord, you don't know all the stuff I gave up. <laughs> yes, he does. Yes, he does. A lot of things are our duty to do, brethren. Verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? You know, a whole lot of good stuff on that too. They're not found that return to give God to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Do you realize how much God does for lost people? And yet they show no gratitude. How many things the Lord gives them, allows them to breathe, you know? Feeds them, clothes them, you know? That they give God glory? Mostly no. But the ones of us that, uh, oh, I don't know, um, repent, turn from our own self-righteousness and turn to the Lord and say, thank you. Please save me. I need help. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Hmm. What an interesting thought. And as a sick man or woman, you come to the Lord, and you, you get down, and you say, God, please heal me. I can't heal myself. Please save me. Thy faith hath made thee whole. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Interesting how the Lord gets a little thing in there about salvation. Verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus pulls kind of a little fast one on them there. They're looking and saying the kingdom of God meaning the physical kingdom. And Jesus is saying, You don't want the physical kingdom because you're speaking to the king here and you reject me. So why on earth would I set up a kingdom and try to let you people rule? See? So what Jesus does is he switches physical kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, that's written about in Matthew, the book of Matthew, solely in the book of Matthew. Nowhere else is the kingdom of heaven ever mentioned. But Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 talks about the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay? That's not where God is. Nobody takes God's kingdom by force. All right? It's talking about the physical kingdom on the earth that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from. And that can also be called the kingdom of God in different passages. Okay? But the kingdom of God, spiritual kingdom of God, is never called the kingdom of heaven. That's very important to understand that. But what Jesus does here is he pulls a little fast one on these guys. They say, when's the physical kingdom? I'll, I'll just say it the way they would have been thinking. When is the physical kingdom going to happen? And Jesus says, you aren't going to get that kingdom. Because you reject me as the king, I'm not going to give it to you. But the spiritual kingdom is within you. Meaning people. Not that they had good fellowship with the Lord. You say, how do you know? Keep your hand there in Luke chapter 17 and go back to Romans chapter 14. Now I'll show you what the kingdom of God is. Uh, 
Romans chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, physical things, in other words, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, fellowship with the Lord. All right, that's what it's talking about there. So Jesus says to these uh, Pharisees there, verse 20, you can go back to Luke chapter 17, they're coming and saying, we want the physical kingdom. Jesus says, nope, not going to happen. All that you're going to get is the spiritual kingdom, if you get saved. Verse 22, And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall see, say to you, See here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. Compared to what we read in Mark 13, and also Matthew chapter 24. Verse 24, Luke 17, verse 24, For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So he separates there the second coming from his first coming. That's the big, that's the huge stumbling block for any Jew out there. Well, the Messiah, when he comes, he has to do the whole thing. There's no rejection there. Um, well, the people rejected him. And again, I, this is too big of a thing to get into with us, this study here. But uh, they rejected the Messiah. So the second coming gets put off for a little while. And you see Jesus explaining that there. Verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Hmm, interesting two things there. You have two different pictures. You have Noah there, and he gets saved, but it's he gets saved through the flood. He goes through it, but the Lord provides for him through it. Whereas Lot, on the other hand, he is taken out of the city before God's judgment comes down. So I believe that there's two types there. Noah being a type of the Jew that goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. God will protect them through that time. Lot, on the other hand, gets taken out before God's judgment comes. I believe typifying a Christian. <coughs> Verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. You have to run away from your career, run away from everything in that time of Jacob's trouble, if you're Jewish. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Okay. Notice it says here in verse 30 and verse 31, in that day, verse 34, in that night. Can it be day and night at the same time? Yep, absolutely. Pretty interesting. Verse 35. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Speaking of grinding at the mill. Okay. Um, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now watch this. Because here a lot of people say, that's the rapture. They're there. One's taken. The other's left. Whoa. You know, this is the rapture. It's not the rapture. Verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? He just said they're taken. The disciples say, where, Lord? Where are they taken? In other words. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Okay? What's he talking about? Go back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit both on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Okay? So where are they taken? They're taken out there. They're fleeing. And they're taken out there to this battle of Armageddon to basically watch the thing, you know. And, of course, people say, well, they flee out into the mountains, into the, 
city of Petra and all this other stuff and whatever. And they're going to be out there, you know, running away from the Antichrist. The Antichrist army is going to be coming to destroy that final remnant of the Jews. Because see, if the Catholics, if the Catholic armies can destroy all the Jews, uh, then God's promises, you know, that he would preserve that seed and everything else, those promises are null and void. That's why the Catholics have always tried to kill the Jews. And it disgusts me when I see Jews nowadays going, well, I think the Catholic Church is a wonderful thing and blah, blah, blah. You fools. Fools. That's what they are. If you're Jewish, don't ever trust the Roman Catholic system. They want you dead. It's called replacement theology. They believe the church has replaced the nation of Israel. Christians don't believe in replacement theology. Satanists do. All right? So that's going to be it. And we're going to do one more chapter yet. Uh, the Luke chapter 21. I'm going to go verse by verse through that because it's another one of the parallels of Matthew 24, Mark 13, we saw a lot of stuff in Luke 17, and now Luke 21. Okay, speaking of this time in Jacob's trouble, and the second coming. Ending with a second coming, not one mention in any of the passages about the rapture of the body of Christ. Right? So that's going to be it. We will see you in the next study.